feel a lot better than I sound. Getting over a little bit of a head cold, though, so if you would bear with me in that. And again, as was mentioned, Mom and Dad are in Oklahoma City visiting Jeremiah and Zoe and their new grandbaby, Hazel Lynn is her name. Um, she was born on Friday evening at about 6.30, and uh, Mom and Baby are both healthy. They're doing great, and I'm sure that many pictures will be posted on Facebook soon, so you can be looking for that. But appreciate the prayers for Zoe and the baby, and and ask that you keep mom and dad in, in your prayers as they travel. Um, but in Matthew chapter 5, uh, we see, of course, the account of the Beatitudes. Um, this is the beginning of the Lord's Sermon on the Mount, as it is known. Um, there in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 4, great multitudes followed Christ from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and they opened. then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so the beatitude that I want to focus on this morning is that first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There are a lot of things that we can learn from this Sermon on the Mount. Many of the things that, that Christians need to know, many of the things that Christians need to have in their character to be faithful to God are included in the Sermon on the Mount. As you look through um, Matthew chapters, really 5 through 7 is where that's found. Uh, we're taught messages and uh, lessons such as being the examples to the world, letting our light shine. We're taught about um, the, the, the marriage bond. We're taught about loving our enemies and the commandments that God has given of us to, to love our brethren, um, to be dedicated to Him. Again, we're taught how to pray as the Lord gives His model prayer there in Matthew, the sixth chapter. And we're taught about where we are to lay our treasures up and where we're to have our focus while we are on this earth, which of course is to lay our treasures up in heaven. Um, we're taught about anxiety and worry and how to uh, deal with that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Many lessons we can learn, but he starts off here with the Beatitudes. Um, and so um, these Beatitudes are essentially blessings that we have in Christ. And I want to first start our study off by looking at a few of those words that we're going to be dealing with in our passage this morning. The first one, of course, being blessed. This uh, Greek word, uh, makarios, is defined as supremely fortunate. When we think about a blessing or we think about being blessed, we think about something that we are, are grateful for, we think about something that we are happy for and thankful for, but this idea of being blessed here and this word that we have has a much deeper meaning than just a simple appreciation for something that was given to us. It has the idea of being in a state of contentment, due to well-being, free from spiritual care, that includes guilt, fear, or dread that we might feel, spiritual jo spiritually joyful and happy, a state of inner contentment, untroubled in one's soul, a state of mind and heart as a result of the acceptance with God. And so these blessings that we have in Christ that are talked about here in Matthew chapter 5, these are things that truly drive our contentment and the, the freedom we have spiritually as Christians. We talk about the liberty that we have in Christ, the freedom that we have in Christ. And of course, we understand that's not the liberty to, to do anything that we want. We certainly have an obligation to obey Christ and fulfill his commands. But the freedom that we have in Christ is that freedom from sin, that peace that comes from knowing that we are in fellowship with God, that we no longer have to worry about those, that former life and those sins that we had before we put on Christ and obeyed the gospel. We can be free of that guilt, free of that fear, um, that, that, you know, that worrying about what's going to come in the next life or well, what our state is because we have that confidence in Christ. We have that confidence in salvation, that confidence in the resurrection. 
and we can be sure of our, our fellowship with God. And so as we talk about the blessings that we have in these Beatitudes, we need to understand how, how significant that is and how important that is and how, how deep the meaning of that blessing is that we have in Christ. The next word there that we want to talk about is poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And this word poor is from the Greek patokos. And the definition there from there is reduced to begging, destitute of wealth, influence, honor, position, lowly, helpless, lacking. The idea of complete and total dependence, humiliation of those in poverty, and that idea that we are in complete need of God. That idea of being poor in spirit is something that we really don't see a lot in this world. Ultimately, what it comes down to is that idea of humility, understanding that we are lacking, that we are desperately in need of something. And that thing that we are desperately in need of is God. That idea of being so, uh, so in, uh, poor in spirit, excuse me, the spirit, that word, uh, Penuma, and again, the pronunciation on these, I apologize because I'm sure I'm not getting them correct. Um, the idea of the soul by which the body is emanated, animated, by which one feels, thinks, decides. In other words, one's personality or one's character. So the character of a man, in order to be blessed by God, to receive the kingdom of heaven, as is stated there in verse 3 of Matthew chapter 5, we need to have an attitude, we need to have a character, a personality that is poor, that is lowly, that is humble, that is lacking, that is helpless, um, and that is completely dependent on God and his, what he has done for us. I think it's pretty, pretty simple to understand the logic in that. If we don't feel like we need God, then we're not going to look to God for that, uh, for that need. We're not going to look to God for what is lacking in our life. We look at the, the contrast of that. The parallel passage to the Beatitudes there in Matthew is found in Luke, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> in Luke's chapter, Luke chapter six, and beginning there in verse 20, he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. He leaves out the, the qualifier there in spirit. But he says, blessed are the poor, for your, are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And then if you look at the end of that section in verse 24, the contrast there to the rich. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. That idea, that difference between the, the poor in spirit versus those who feel that they are rich. I think we understand the, the, the difficulty that comes along with being poor at times and that idea that those that are poor in spirit are looking for something. They're looking for something that they are lacking. They're looking for something that they need. And, um, and that has to be our attitude. We have to humble ourselves and recognize that we are in need of something to make us whole. There's nothing that we can do on this earth to earn heaven. There's, nothing, there's, there's no amount of works. There's no amount of good that we can do to earn our salvation. We are completely and totally dependent on Christ, on his sacrifice for us, and God sending his son to this earth, living, him living that perfect life, being that perfect sacrifice, and shedding his blood for our sins. If we don't recognize that we're in need of that, then we're never going to subject ourselves to Christ and to his authority and to obey his commands. And we see that from a lot of, of people in this world. So to be poor in spirit, what that means, it means we must humbly acknowledge the need for God's help and know that it can only come from him alone. And so first in looking at examples, I want to look at the, the opposite of this first as we get into our study. Look at some of the, the negative examples that we see in scriptures of those who did not have this attitude, this proper attitude of being poor in spirit. The first one is in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and beginning there in verse uh, 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says, uh, these things says the Amen, and the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, 
that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So we see the example here of the Laodiceans. They were, were, were wishy-washy, if you will. They had some faith, but it was a lukewarm faith. They weren't on fire for the Lord. They were just going through the motions. They weren't fully and completely dedicated to serving God. And because of that, he wasn't pleased with them. He said, I'd, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but since you're lukewarm, I will spew you out. I'll vomit you out of my mouth. But notice the, the reason given for why they were lukewarm there in the next verse in verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, you have be- I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? And so one of the, the, the reasons that the Laodiceans were not right with God and were lukewarm, they weren't having the zeal and the dedication that they needed to is because they didn't have that characteristic and that attitude of being poor in spirit. They were rich. They, they felt that they were wealthy. And because of that, they didn't feel that they were in need of anything. They didn't recognize their spiritual poverty and their need for their dependence on God. We've got to make sure that we don't fall into that category. We live in a very wealthy nation. We live in a place where very few of us ever have that, that intense need of anything. We pretty much all have an idea of where our next meal is going to come from. We all pretty much know that we're going to have a roof over our heads tonight and a place to lay our head on the pillow, those sorts of things. And so when we're talking about our physical needs, this plays into it. And, and that idea of, of that security and that safety that we have because of where we are in life, we need to make sure that that doesn't creep into our faith and help us to think that, hey, we don't need God. We are in need of Him, and we need to make sure that we understand that and are dedicated to Him because of that. You know, you hear, and uh, one of the things that I, is my responsibility, or was, is treasure. I'm no longer treasure of the congregation. Isaiah is taking care of that for me now, thankfully. We're kind of transitioning that. But I'm in contact with uh, many of the preachers that we support overseas. Um, we support a couple of Indian preachers and, and one in South Africa. and Well, in, in Africa. It's in Zimbabwe, which is, I believe is in the south. Correct? Yeah, southern part of Africa, but it's not South Africa. Anyway, those, those men will, will give us reports and they'll give us information about the work that they're doing. And it's not uncommon for them to talk about many individuals being baptized at once. Um, you know, 10, 20, 30 individuals putting on Christ in baptism and being converted and, and obeying the gospel. And we see those things in these third world countries. It's, it's very common in the Philippines as well. And then we, you know, contrast that with what we see here in America and what we see in our congregations. And we don't have baptisms very often. You know, I don't know when the last time this baptistry's um, been used. It's always ready, but it's certainly not used as often as what we hear about in those third world countries. There's, there's several reasons for that. Um, you know, we certainly don't want to make excuses and limit our responsibility. We need to be working harder to go preach and to, to reach those that are in a, uh, a condition where their soul is lost and bring them to Christ. But one of, the, one of the difficulties of being in the country that we're at with so much relative wealth compared to the rest of the world, we've got some hurdles that, that other countries don't have to, to jump over in order to reach people. And, and that's one of the things that we're talking about this, this, this morning. You know, there aren't a whole lot of people in America that have that characteristic of being poor in spirit, of being in that deep state of poverty and need to where they're constantly searching for something. There's so much wealth and so much abundance that so many people in our country today think that they don't need God. They've got everything they have uh, because of what they've done, and they, they put their... their um, you know, their faith in themselves and in their own abilities. They don't recognize God. They don't recognize his power and his authority. And they don't feel that they need him. And we see that example in places in Scripture. And the, the Laodiceans were somewhat like that. And that their wealth and then the, the, the things that they had, 
they didn't think that they needed Christ. And because of that, they weren't dedicated to him. We need to make sure that that doesn't creep into our spiritual lives and into our faith and prevent us from serving God in an acceptable way. In James, the second chapter, if you would turn to James chapter 2, we see how God looks at the rich of the world. There are several places in the New Testament where it talks about the rich and how difficult it is for them to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But in James chapter 2 and verse 5, James says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you out, um, drag you into the courts? You know, they were showing partiality here, and he was telling them, Hey, don't show partiality to the rich just because they're rich. They dress nicer. They've got a, a, you know, a higher status in society. You're looking at the wrong things. It's not about their physical well-being. It's not about their place in this world. It's about their spirit, their soul. Where are they spiritually? The poor are the ones God has chosen, and it's because the poor typically are the ones that are going to look to Christ for what they need. They're going to humble themselves. They're going to obey Christ and follow him. And so we see the contrast here between rich and poor. And again, understand, that means it's a sin to be rich. There's nothing in the scripture that teaches it's a sin to be rich and to be wealthy in and of itself. We're talking about the character of someone, the spirit of someone. But these two do go hand in hand. The more wealth you have, the harder it's going to be for you to be poor in spirit. That's something that you're probably going to have to work at a lot harder than someone who is in poverty and has nothing and, and, and is very limited in what they have in this life. The condition, this is from Albert Barnes' commentary, he says the condition and circumstances of the poor make them more likely to embrace the offers of the gospel than the rich. A great number of believers are taken from those that live a humble life. In contrast, we see a common attitude among the character of the rich of the world. They seek things of the earthly life. They are trying to seek material things and have more and more and more. Again, they look to themselves as self-sufficient. They put a lot of what they have in their own abilities, and they don't give credit to God who created them and created all things in this, this earth. And they're, they're, there's a lot of pride there. There's a lot of arrogance in that attitude. And that pride and arrogance is exactly what stops them or gets in the way of them serving God. We can't go to God on his terms. We've got to go, or on our terms, we've got to go to God on his terms. And that takes humility um, and, and pride and arrogance can get in the way of that. And Mark, the 10th chapter. In verses 24 and 25, a passage we're all familiar with. How, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Again, it's not impossible to go to heaven if you're rich, but it does cause some difficulties. There's no doubt that it is difficult, and there's a reason that that, that principle is taught throughout Scripture. 1 Timothy 6, 10 through 11. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Okay? Again, we talk about that. It's not money that's evil. Money in and of itself isn't evil. It's just a medium of exchange. All right? But the love of money, if that's what you love, if that's what you seek, if that is what you put your, your goals and your ambitions into obtaining, that is the root of all kinds of evil. But you, O oh man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. Paul was encouraging the young preacher Timothy here to do away with those worldly, secular, monetary things and pursue righteousness. And what it comes down to is contentment. Um, again, in that same uh, chapter in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8, and having food and clothing with all these things, we shall be content. In Philippians 4 and verse 11, Paul states, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And that's uh, an important lesson that we have to learn as Christians. We're not going to be poor in spirit if we're not content. Um, these two things go along very well. And what it comes down to uh, is where are we putting our priorities? Where are we putting our importance? Again, in the Sermon on the Mount, we're told not to lay up our treasures on earth, but to lay up our treasures in heaven. 
Are we seeking to obtain material things and monetary things? Are we seeking to obtain status? Maybe it's a promotion at work or it's a certain place in our secular society. Or are we putting our priorities on God? Are we humbling ourselves before God, being poor in spirit and recognizing that no matter what we have secularly in this earth is going to replace what we have in heaven. We talk, we've been talking about in the Wednesday night class about the Apostle Paul and how he was willing to give up all that he had in his previous life. He had a high position among the Jewish nation. He had a high position and a prestigious position. He was looked up to um, for, for his um, position in Judaism and what he was doing uh, to persecute Christians and to persecute the faith. And he, was, he gave all that up because of what Christ was offering. He humbled himself. He recognized that he needed Christ and that there was nothing in this world that could replace those blessings that come from Christ. We see how the world looks upon the poor. We tend to look on the poor and, and look at them and, and pity them and, and look at them in a way um, that, that we feel sorry for them. But we see that Christ... He was kind of the opposite. He pitied those that were proud, those that pursued wealth, those that were rich, as we read about, because they aren't able, again, talking stereotypically, typically they're not able to look at those things that are important, those spiritual things. In James 1, if you would turn with me back to the book of James, James chapter 1 and in verse 9, we're told, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. You know, if you look at, uh, you know, one of my, my interests and my hobbies is financial stuff. Um, I teach economics, and it's a personal finance class at the, at the high school I teach at. And so, I've, you know, there's some interest to me in that. And a lot of the, the individuals that you look into and talk about and how they became wealthy and how they became successful financially, one of the common themes among all of them is they basically put away every other thing that they could possibly devote their time to except pursuing those financial goals and they have a singular focus the the 60 70 80 hour work weeks and just this ridiculous dedication and devotion to making that money and to becoming financially successful and again it makes sense if you want to if you want to make the most money you're going to have to work the hardest but they very much have their goals focused on that financial goal on that that material object and pursuing that and and they dedicate their life to it and it's at the it, it, it's at the um you know the the words not coming to me detriment to their families many of these they're, they're they're single men in their 40s they have no family they have no wife no children if they did a lot of them they're divorced and they're estranged and they're on their second their third marriage and and they certainly don't have a faith in god or a dedication to god they're very prideful. They're very proud of what they did because it was them that did it. And um, just the complete opposite of what a Christian should be. And so, you know, the world looks at that. And a lot of people in the world will say, hey, I want to be like that person because of how financially successful they are. But these rich, these that are dedicated to that, they will pass away. So the rich man also will fade in his pursuits. They can't take any of that with them. And they're going to learn that one day at the end of their life. They're going, to wake, they're, they're going to realize the mistakes that they have made. We need to make sure that those, those attitudes and those ideas don't creep into our life and our character and make our faith less than what it should be. Again, there in James, now in the fifth chapter, James chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming to you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, 
and the cries of the reapers will reach the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. We see how poorly the Lord looks on those that are rich, those that pursue those riches. We think about and read about the rich man who is unwilling to give up all that he had because he had great material possessions and wasn't willing to give up that in order to obtain the kingdom of heaven. But blessed are the poor in spirit because ours is the kingdom of heaven. So I want to look at a couple of examples now as we finish up of individuals in the scriptures that were indeed poor in spirit that showed that humility. The first is Moses. If you want to turn to, with me to Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. <clears throat> and of course we understand the important role Moses played in delivering the children of Israel from their bondage under Pharaoh in Egypt. And we read here in chapter 12 of Numbers in verse 3 that now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. And so when we think about Moses, we think about how he had to humble himself and completely and totally trust in God that God would deliver the children of Israel. We think back to when God first asked Moses to go and to do that. What was his response? He said, oh, not me. Can't be me. I, I don't speak well. And, you know, there's got to be somebody better. And so this wasn't something that Moses did uh, at first. He had to work towards it. He had to develop into it, I think, a little bit. We saw at times he didn't trust God like he should. But ultimately, he had to trust completely and totally in God. And by in doing that, he had to recognize um, his, you know, he had to be humility. He had to recognize the pride of, of his knowledge that was getting the way. He didn't think he could do it. According to his wisdom, he wasn't good enough. But when he put his faith in God and trusted in God, we understand that everything that he needed to be successful in what God had tasked him to do was given to him. And, um, you know, he was able to, through God's help and through God's, um, you know, intervention to lead the children of Israel out of that bondage that they had in Egypt. Back in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 18, we see a perfect contrast of two individuals. One that had the pride, the arrogance um, that we've been warning about in our lesson today uh, or against in our lesson today. And then one that had that humility, had that, that poorness of spirit that we're to have that, that's talked about there in Matthew chapter 5. But in Luke 18 and verse, um, beginning in verse 11, we see the, the Pharisee and the tax collector and the contrast here. Actually, let's just go ahead and begin in verse 9. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner." I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be exalted or will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Which of these men had the, the poorness of spirit? It certainly was not the Pharisee. It was the tax collector. The tax collector who wouldn't raise his eyes to heaven. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He recognized his spiritual poverty. He recognized that he was in need of Christ and he humbled himself. And because of that humility, he was the one that was going to get that exaltation that was going to receive that reward. We need to make sure that we are more like the tax collector in this situation and less like the Pharisee. We need to be poor in spirit. 
And of course, we have the, the perfect example of this in our Savior, Jesus Christ, of being poor in spirit. We look at Christ and we look at the humility that he had to have to come to this earth. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 through 9, we're told that he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He had a place in heaven, but he humbled himself and he came to this earth so that we could have that hope of heaven. He died on the cross, was, his blood was shed because of the love that he had for us. We certainly can say that Christ was poor in spirit. There's a lot of areas that we can make application of this in our everyday lives. And I just want to mention a couple. I'm not going to get into uh, you know as many as even I was intending. My voice is quickly fading fast, even more than it already is. But when we are talking about being poor in spirit, one of the areas of our life where we need this, you know, especially, is when we are repenting of sin. When we're repenting of sin, we need to be poor in spirit. We need to recognize what we're in need of, that forgiveness that we're in need of. We need to humble ourselves and be willing to fully turn from those things that we are doing wrong. In the book of Psalms, in Psalm 51, we see a perfect example of this with David. Psalm 51 is a prayer of repentance that is from David after he was caught in sin and in adultery with Bathsheba after Nathan went to him and said, you are the man. And he realized the wrong that he was in and the wrong that he was doing. And he prayed this prayer of repentance and throughout it, you can see the humility that he has. He says in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God. He recognized that he was in need. Wash me, in verse 2, thoroughly from my iniquity. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned. There was a complete and total recognition of what he had done. You know, a lot of times when we see uh, repentance, it's not full. And we look at 2 Corinthians 7 and see the repentance of the Corinthians there and how they did everything they could to prove themselves that they had turned from their wrongdoings. Now, how often do we hear of someone that repents and it'll be something to the extent of, well, if I offended someone, I'm sorry, or if I did something wrong, I'm sorry, or I'm sorry for what I did, but... You know, so-and-so kind of made me and put me in a position where I acted this way, and, and they're really not willing to take full responsibility. It's because that, that poorness of spirit is not there. That humility is not there. There's still that pride that's in the way of them completely and fully accepting what they did. We see it with kids, right? You know, we, we get onto our children. We discipline our children. Um, Luca gets disciplined a lot right now. He's at that age. Is he truly sorry for what he does? You know, the other day he drew on his sister's bed with some highlighter, you know, and so he got a spanking for it. He's paying attention now because he heard, heard his name, you know, and, and in that moment, I'm sorry, Dad, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Was he truly sorry? Well, he was sorry he got caught for sure. <laughs> I don't know that the true sorry was there. That's what we're working on. That's why we're training him. When he's truly sorry, I'll know because you know what? He's going to stop doing those things. But now, you know, he's at that point now where it's something every day, you know, something else that he's sorry he got caught for, but he doesn't understand that true repentance. But he's just a child. But how many, how many times do we see someone who does something wrong, and yeah, they're sorry because they can't deny it anymore. They got caught, but we don't see that true, you know, 180-degree turn from how they were living and what they were doing that was sinful. We need to make sure that that's not us. David had that true penitent heart. He, had, he was poor in spirit. He had that humility to completely and totally turn away from that sin and make it right. He didn't blame anybody else for what he had done. He could have said, well, Bathsheba, she didn't hide herself well enough when I saw her. And, you know, she's at fault too. Okay, he didn't do that. He didn't mention her when he was repenting. 
Okay, he, he fessed up to what he had done. We need to make sure that we do that if we ever sin against God. We need to fully repent of that and turn from what we're doing. We need to be poor in spirit when it comes to our marriages. That's something that we see time and time again. Problems between husbands and wives. And one of the reasons for that is because neither are at that point of humility that they need to have to... To, to accept their role in that relationship that God has given them and the way that God has, has patterned it and has fashioned it. Um, and they're not willing to put the other person first. They're not willing to do the things necessary to have a godly marriage. And a lot of it comes from pride. It comes from a lack of humility and being poor in spirit. And then finally, it's just simple obedience. In James, the first chapter final passage that I'll leave you with today, but in James chapter 1, <clears throat> the writer talks here about how we are to act when it comes to our obedience to the gospel. James chapter 1, and beginning in verse 21, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So when we hear the word, not only do we hear it, but we've got to be humble, humble ourselves to it and obey it. Be doers of it and not just hearers. He says, if anyone is a hearer and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. We've got to be humble enough and, and do away with our pride to where we can look in the mirror and truly ask ourselves and answer ourselves honestly, are we following God's commands? Are we doing as God would have us to do? That takes, again, that takes humility. That takes being poor in spirit, as we're talking about here in Matthew chapter 5 in the first part of these Beatitudes. And if we do these things, if we truly humble ourselves before God and submit to His will, his way, not our ways. His wisdom, not our wisdom. Then what will our reward be? Well, then ours is the kingdom of heaven. But we can't do that till we completely humble ourselves before him. We have to feel that helplessness, that, that idea of being destitute without him and rely and trust on him and him alone and only his word and his will. And if we do that, then we're going to have that reward of heaven one day and there's nothing in this earth, there's nothing on this earth, no physical thing, no relationship that is worth sacrificing that reward of heaven one day um, that we'll have if we are, are, are faithful to him. So with that, the lesson is yours. Again, I appreciate the, the patience and understanding with my voice. I hope you were able to hear all of that. Um, but we want to offer an invitation to those that are here today. There may be some... That, that have not named Christ, have not put on Christ in baptism. As we mentioned, the baptistry is ready. Perhaps the only thing that's standing before you and the Lord is, is a little bit of that pride that we've talked about today. You haven't quite made that decision to truly humble yourself before Him and subject yourself to His will. But if you're, you're willing to do that at this time, we ask that you would come forward now. If we can help you in any spiritual way, come forward as we stand and sing the song that's been selected.